I believe that knowledge is power. And this is why so many people in America especially feel powerless because they have no knowledge. Unless you understand freedom and how, how it, where it came from and how it was obtained, and unless you start thinking in terms of protecting your rights and your freedoms, for he who would be deceived, let him. You need to educate yourself about how the world really works. Because as long as you don't understand how you are being used, how you're being lied to, mistreated, deceived, you're never going to be able to get out of the mess we're in. That's absurd. Knowledge is the key. And again, maybe not. And unfortunately, too many people are preoccupied with watching television and sports and trying to make a dollar just to stay alive. They don't realize what's really going on behind the scenes in our country of America and around the world. Unless and until you educate yourself as to how your world operates, you're never really going to experience freedom. 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 Because as a man thinketh, so is he. That's what I hope to help you do. I'm Jordan Maxwell. since I made one of these. I've missed you. I've missed doing this. I've been involved in some projects around the house as well as uh, work. And then uh, also I finished up my audiobook and I just decided to release it on YouTube. I decided not to try and tie into podcasts and more things to have to download and more apps to apply and all that stuff. I thought, why not just release it? on YouTube, and then that way everybody can have access to it easily, worldwide. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. I'm real excited about having it out. Now if you haven't seen my Human Origin series, or if you haven't watched it in a while, you might want to watch it first. I have two videos out already, and it would be a good idea to watch those because those concepts and philosophies that I shared in those videos undergird what I'm going to be talking about today and there's not going to be a lot of preemptive stuff here so it would be a good idea to prepare yourself because my theory and philosophy about human origin is not within the normal prescriptions that have been applied to culture so we're all coming into an awareness right now that the world is not as it seems to be, that it is not as you were educated it is, and that the systems, the cultural systems here in the West, I grew up in the West, I know the West, so I'll speak for the West, in the sense that the educational systems here are all corrupted. It doesn't matter if you're talking about medical issues for your body, if you're talking about agricultural issues for your food, if you're talking about hydration issues with your water, if you're talking about the political systems or judicial systems, 
all of them are corrupt and, and we're all getting a really big education right now as to how corrupt the uh, Western political system is. So that's not a hard sell. And I think it's pretty well accepted by most people that 9-11 was an inside job and that there are things like MK Ultra and Project Paperclip and these well-known established quote-unquote conspiracy theories are no longer conspiracy but we actually know them to be true and so all of this points to the fact that the world is not as it's supposed to be all of the sciences they've all been infiltrated I mean look they're trying to sell the the climate change thing they're trying to sell this idea that we're all going to be underwater fear and it's just bad science it's it's just really bad just like what they're telling you to eat I mean if you look at the other day I was with Jen uh, my wife and I told her about this photo I saw from 1970 it was I think around Huntington Beach or Newport or something California and it was just a public shot of the beach area I promise you okay I promise you I couldn't find one obese person and, and not even that, I couldn't even find an overweight person. In the whole photo, there must have been, there must have been 200 people in this photo on the beach. It was packed and everyone's in swimsuits, so there's no hiding. And I'm telling you, there wasn't one obese person and there wasn't even overweight people. Everybody was fit. This is 1969, 1970. And now look at society. You can't go anywhere without seeing an obese person. Why do you think that's the case? Certainly, some of the cases are medical, I get it, but most of the cases aren't. This is a lifestyle choice. Why do you think that is? Bad education, a person doesn't know themselves. They don't know what they're doing to themselves. They don't realize they're killing themselves. And that when you are obese, your heart issues, your metabolism, metabolism issues, your immune system issues, food allergies, these kind of things, are all exacerbated. And a person, a person doesn't realize these things because they've been poorly educated. Okay, that's a really good example of unawareness. Now imagine, now imagine if you applied that to our origin, that same disassociation disconnection with our authentic self or who we authentically are and when you don't realize who you are that changes your perspective of the world that you see and then your response to that world so in the same way if you don't know your origin it brings a whole lot of questions to the table and as we walk into the Great Awakening like we are Everybody's walking into a room or a, or a warehouse or a world that is very, very different than the world you came from. Certainly in 2015, I didn't know half the things that I know about the political systems, the financial systems, and the world systems, the, the governing systems and medical systems and so forth, that I thought I knew in 2015, I don't know that well now. Or I know well now what I didn't know in 2015. Okay. This has changed then my behavior perspective, my telos as a human being, because I'm now aware of, a better aware of human origin, and I'm better aware of human history, I'm better aware of the lies that they, that they told us. I had a whole bout with cancer for years, or for a year or two, where I learned all about how I'd been lied to my whole life about medical stuff. And I'm alive today. I'm alive today because I what I learned when I had cancer. Cancer was a gift for me. It's not for everyone, but it was a gift for me. It taught me a lot of things. Showed me a lot of things. It also broke me out of the religious spell that I was under. I was a Christian. And trauma changes you because you move out of the world that brought you to that space of trauma. And so you're a different person when you come out of that space. And so cancer was a teacher for me. It was a traumatic teacher for me. And it taught me things about myself. 
things about the stuff that I had learned, things that I thought I knew and understood. It taught me, no, you're wrong about all those things. It truly was a teacher, okay? There's a whole story to that I won't get into. The point being, it's a different world. And what I'm about to tell you is outlandish. Since Napoleon, every single war has been controlled by a single entity, both sides. World War I and World War II were coercions. Most people, I mean, Ford, and you can look this up, Ford was making engines for the Nazis in World War II for their tanks and their Jeeps. They had Ford engines in them. Do you realize that? Do you realize that all of the corrupt leadership of Germany through Pod, Project Paperclip, all of those scientists that were doing experiments on human beings, they were all imported to America to safe havens, to continue the studies on people. This, is, this isn't conspiracy that I'm talking about right now. These are known things that have happened. And I think that when people talk about the Great Awakening, they think of it very loosely, like it's going to apply to everybody but them. Because the world that they know and accept and assume is the world, is reality. Can you see this? Can you see how self-deception keeps people unaware? Okay, so all of that said, to assume that the creation story and evolution story are the most accurate options for human beings is nutty when you put it in the context of everything else. Because it's going to be tainted also. The stories that you know, what you've been told, is also tainted. Now you may not you may not subscribe to this, but in in my historical studies and studying Rome and the Catholic Church, the, those two are one and the same thing. Rome didn't die; it became the Catholic Church. Okay, and it's the Roman Catholic Church that gave the West the Bible. If I can find it, I'll play the. Alan Watts clip where he describes where the Bible came from. It came from the Catholic Church. A lot of people don't know how we got the Bible at all. We Westerners got the Bible thanks to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church and members of the Church wrote the books of the New Testament. And they took over the books of the Old Testament, which even by the time of Christ had not been finally decided upon by the Jews. The Jews did not close the canon of the Old Testament until the year 100 AD or thereabouts at the Synod of Jamnia. And then they finally decided which were the canonical books of the Hebrew Scriptures and embodied them in the Masoretic text, the earliest copy of which dates from the 10th century, early in the 10th century AD. The books to be included in the New Testament were not finally decided upon until the year 382 AD again at the Synod of Rome under Pope Damasus. So it was the church, the Catholic Church, that promulgated the Bible and said we are giving you these scriptures on our authority and by the authority of the informal tradition that has existed among us from the beginning, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So you receive historically the Bible on the church's say-so. And the Catholic Church insists, therefore, that the church, collectively, speaking under the presumed guidance of the Holy Spirit, has the authority to interpret the Bible. And you can take that or leave it. So, if the church says the Bible is true, it finally comes down to you. Are you going to believe the church or aren't you? 
if nobody believes the church, it will be perfectly plain, won't it, that the church has no authority. Okay, I'm going to show you something startling here. This is the uh, sigil of Baphomet, and that's a goat head. This is the principal sign of Lucifer in Satanism and Luciferianism. That's the goat head. The upside down pentagram contains the goat head. Okay, now this is the seat or the chair of St. Peter at the Vatican. Now, it's a goat head. Do you see it? It should be quite obvious. There is a uh, the light above the goat head, which is the light of Lucifer, because Lucifer is a being of light. So the light is over the head. The mouth is the seat, the base of the seat. The two eyes are the pillars that are on the left and right of the seat. And then the ears coming off are the rays, supposed rays of sunlight. Now if I superimpose Lucifer, or the sigil of Baphomet, over it, do you see how it's a goat head? They like to do this because um, they like to put it right in your face. Here, I'll make it go back and forth a little bit. These people are Satanists. This is a satanic institution. Look at the Papal Hall. What does that look like to you? It looks like a snake, doesn't it? Snake mouth, the fangs, the eyes. This is the monstrosity they call art, or the Catholic Church uh, calls art. Uh, it's supposedly Jesus coming out of hell. It looks like a bunch of demons to me. But this is what is at the center of the Papal Hall. This is the Pope kissing the crotch of Jesus. These are pedophiles. Like I've said many times before, this has always been a pedophilic institution. Rome was filled with pedophilia. This is a pedophilic institution. Always has been. Okay, now, now I'm going to go really off the map here. Did, did you know that the tunnels underneath St. Pete's in the Vatican were there before St. Pete's was built. The catacombs, the tunnels, underneath Rome. Those were all already there before they built the church. Now, what were those used for? The tunnels, what do we know they're used for? human trafficking. Do you understand that it's the level of deception? I'm not, I'm not joking around here. I'm not like nuts, like spouting stuff off. Understand the gravity of what I'm saying right now. What I'm saying is the entire Western spiritual system that's established and accepted was developed and passed down from a human trafficking network. Do you really? Western religion was developed by the people who ruled the world. And those people are not humane people. And there's a reason for that. They are the same ones who gave you the evolution and creation stories. Those were developed, those were developed by the same groups that developed Greece and Rome, that undergirded Pharaonic Egypt. Folks, that power has always been driving the human race, controlling it, manipulating it. This is why Pharaonic Egypt was an inheritance. It exists. The, it, the Egyptians didn't build the pyramids. That's what I'm trying to say. That was an. That was a passing on of an inheritance of power, built by species that weren't human. There was an alien group called the Elohim. This. These were. This was the engineering team for the human species. If we go back to Genesis 1, the very first chapter in the Bible, Genesis 1, 
So many people today believe and have been told, and that's why they believe it, that God made us, God made man. And they will point to the scripture that says God created Adam and Eve. And then they will say, see, there it is, God made man. But that's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say that God made man. In the beginning, the first chapter of Genesis says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But that's not exactly what it says in the Hebrew. This is why we are emphasizing that it says God created the heavens and the earth. But in Hebrew, the word God is El, E-L. So if we were to read this first chapter, the first verse, uh, in Hebrew, it would say, in the beginning, El created the heavens and the earth. But that's not what it says in Hebrew. It says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, not El. So in uh, Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So it's more than one God. But here's the important part. We see it again. This is from another Bible translation where the word God shows up, and then it says in Hebrew, it's Elohim, which is plural, more than one. This is what has confused people around the world because the actual word in the Bible is God's, and this is why you will see in a lot of the reference works, they will make the distinction and show you this, the plural form of El. Now, when you go to the actual scriptures, in a Hebrew Bible, and the Jewish Bible, it says, Elohim, we shall make man in our image and after our likeness. But it actually says in Hebrew, Elohim said we, W-E meaning more than one. We will make man. First, you need to know that the people we call the ancient Hebrews were not Hebrews as such. They were, in fact, Phoenician or Canaanites. And this is where the you can trace back in the encyclopedias and in the, in the dictionaries about ancient Cana and the ancient area we call today Israel and Lebanon, that whole area. They were called Canaanites. They were, the so-called Hebrews were, in that time, henotheistic, meaning picking one God out of many. Here at Liberty University, they had articles about henotheism toward the assessment of a divine plurality in, in the Hebrew Bible. I'm hoping to show you that this is understood in many Bible reference works, the word henotheism and what it actually means. Now, it's interesting, too, is that when Elohim, or the gods, said, come let us make man in our image after our likeness, uh, as I was told many years ago, this was a, mis a misunderstanding of the sentence. You should not read it that God said, come let us make man in our image after our likeness, and then that would prove that God made man. No. It, the correct way to understand it is that the God says, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Not make man, but let's make him in our image, after our likeness. Well, that, of course, implies that we have been uh, tampered with, with our DNA. This is maybe a long time ago, but nonetheless, we were, we've been tampered with and we still are today. We're still, even as humans, we're still tampering with our own DNA.
God did not make man as you will see. The word in Hebrew for man is ish. I-S-H in Hebrew is man. But the Bible says God made Adam, A-D-M, not ish. But if you go back to the Hebrew Bible and read it, it says in this Hebrew Bible preface, it says, according to this, the Hebrew word for woman is isha, comes from the Hebrew word for man, ish. But the Bible does not say God created ish. It says God created A-D-M, and then and this is important too. It doesn't say that God created Adam. The letter was A-D-M. We, uh, we humans added, the, make it the, to be uh, Adam, but it's not Adam, it's A-D-M. Here we have the Hebrew translation going back to Hebrew. It says we, again, we shall make Adam, A-D-M which means a different kind of creature, Adam, A-D-M, not Adam. And, he will, and we will make him in the image of us, A-D-M, not Ish, which means they, have ta- they saw Ish, and then they took Ish and remade him into Adam. And we call it Adam. No, the gods came here, they saw this man, and therefore, the man must have been like a Neanderthal man or some, crea- uh, some ancient creature, a hominid. And the gods said, let us make him look like us. Let, him, let us make him in our image. So that's what I'm saying. God did not create man because man is ish. Chapter 9 says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. When I talked to the rabbi many years ago, I said, Is this a correct translation that says, uh, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth? Re means to do it again. And he said, well, obviously, if there were people here on the earth and God decided to destroy that civilization of that time, and now there's nobody on the earth except uh, Noah and his sons and their wives, if you're going to have people on the earth, you're going to have to replenish the earth, obviously. So I said, all right, so therefore, replenish is correct. Yes, yes. This is important because if you go to Genesis 1, where God is, uh, is creating Adam and his wife, it says, this is in Genesis 1, and 28, it says, God created man in his own image. After the image of God created he, male and female created them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. God came here and saw what the Hebrews call Ish, which was the ancient man, these ancient hominid creatures. And they said, come, let us make these creatures to look like us and be like us. So how many people in the world have ever thought about Adam and Eve were not the first creatures on the earth? There have been civilizations here for millions of years. Now we begin to see the actual truth is that God did not make man he remade the, the creatures that were here that we call hominids, and that's where we have come from. We look like the gods that created us. And if you're a born-again, devout Christian, hearing that, I mean, right then and there, if you didn't shut the video off, right there I stepped off the plank. <laughs> I, I jumped right off into the abyss on that one. Because we have this idea of ourselves that's false. We have developed our appreciation of ourselves through means of exclusivity. 
through means of being the one and only. And that is what the, the basis is for people to determine their value. But your values have to change if you're going to be able to expand into the Great Awakening. And so your values of yourself and your origin are gonna to have to expand past the limited values that were handed to you. In other words, you find, as a Christian, you find your value in the sense that God sent his son to save you. And so your, your inner value, the value you have you, in you that you have in yourself is through this idea of someone dying for you, giving their life to you, this idea of grace. So without those as your principal subjects for your value, right? If those are removed, then your self-value is dissolved and that's that's terrible like you the feeling of that is very unsettling it causes fear and so what I'm trying to do here is to break you out of this small view you have of yourself that you're this isolated creature that's the only one in the entire universe that looks like God that that belittles your intellect -y. The inner motivation and animation of you, your soul, the self-motivating, self-organizing processing of yourself, of your spirit, your intellect, that's compromised, your awareness of that is compromised when you view yourself in this small world that religion puts you in. Because it doesn't allow for you to have any other origin source but what it has told you. So if another origin source comes along in this great awakening, you can't handle that. It's too outlandish and so it doesn't go down because you've put your value in the very small world idea you have of yourself, that you're this unique creature in the universe and the only one that God sent his son for. This belittles you. And I, 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 I'm not trying to like crap all over the, the uh, redemption story. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to help you expand past it. To see yourself of greater value than something that needs to be saved. To see yourself of greater value than something identified as a sinner. Because you're not. You're not a sinner and you don't need to be saved. These belittle you and your potential. So you're going to have to find your value in another identity. And that identity and what I tried to describe was in my book, was through nature. The impossibility that surrounds you is the same impossibility that you are. Identity, identifying through the nature which you are part and parcel. You're a, you're a assim, assimilation of nature, of nature's bounty the material world that surrounds you right you are a jewel within that okay and so finding your value in the impossibility and the the uh, ineffability that that is all about you and that engulfs you so that that you also are the same exact impossibility ineffability you're the, you're the same exact level. Okay, so when you, when you put your value in nature rather than a religion, right? If, when you put your value in, in nature, you then can identify and you are in cohesion with your environment. That's very important to being in a state of peace. In other words, there's no forgiveness necessary for you to be at peace and for you to be happy and for you to be fulfilled here on this planet. You do, in other words, you don't have to believe anything. Just recognize your consciousness is also in everything else. The consciousness that is in the trees, the consciousness that is in the rocks, the consciousness that's in the water, in the ocean, the consciousness that's in the planet, the consciousness that's in the sun is the same consciousness that you carry. Because you are the light, not the bulb talked about that in my book. The value of the bulb is the light which emanates from it. The value of the human being is the consciousness, is the awareness that emanates from you.
the greater your consciousness, the greater your awareness, right? The more humane you become because the more value you sense in everything around you. That's why identifying through nature, you value nature in the same way that you value yourself. And so therefore you behave appropriately because you value nature for just what it is and you value yourself for just what you are. Not because you believe something. Your value doesn't come because you were saved. This is why thinking that yourself as a sinner is not a good idea because your value then doesn't come from yourself. It comes from an external being. It comes from an external idea which is unfulfilling because it's all in the imagination and the mind is an illusion. Do you see this? This heavier philosophy is what's going to ground you as we walk into the Great Awakening because everything you know has been a lie. And that's a hard thing to accept. Changing your worldview, changing your values, changing what you value yourself in and value yourself as who you are, changing all of that is very disruptive and frightening. And so I'm here to help you understand that there's nothing to be afraid of. Identifying through nature is a beautiful thing. It's easy to do because that's what you are. You're a nature creature. You are a part and parcel of nature. We as human beings are vibrational creatures. We operate on vibration. The earth operates on vibration. We are in an electromagnetic universe. We are not in a gravitationally driven universe. It's electromagnetics that's in, that's in play. That's why they've made machines that can hover that make no sound. It's electromagnetics spinning things and so because we're in this spiraling vortex of a reality that's based on vibration we also are that same image think of water forming a, a current or a, or a funnel as it goes down the drain the funnel exists because of the flow without the flow of water the funnel wouldn't exist we're the same image the flow of the electromagnetics is, is our life, is our existence. Your DNA is a crystalline structure that vibrates. It works through vibration, just like the chakras, okay? And that crystalline structure resonates at particular frequencies. This is life, okay? That's your DNA. And that vibration, that resonance, is, is your consciousness, okay? So your being who you are is wrapped up and encased in this amazing thing called DNA. Your personality, your skin color, your hair color, your eye color, your emotions and feelings, your tendencies, your gifts, abilities, your spiritual inclinations, all are tied into the vibrations on this lattice in the DNA. Okay. That tunes you into this reality. There are many realities because there are many frequencies. And so the frequency that we're on here on this planet is what composes what we see. And you and I both know there are radio waves, microwaves, gamma waves. There are all these different waves that we don't see that are everywhere around us. That's why you can turn on your radio and it picks up this frequency you can't see. Okay, that, that's real, that you can picture that, okay. Your reality is the same type of focus as a radio station. You're the colors you see, the vibrational frequency that you're at. This is, this is the very thin reality that you exist in. And I say thin meaning that there's a much larger reality in play that you're not aware of. In the same way that I wasn't aware of a lot of things before I had cancer. But when you come into awareness of them, you realize, wow, it's a bigger reality than I thought, than I assumed. Okay, you haven't been told these things so that you are dumbed down and you don't realize all the layers. You don't see all the different areas to see. Your perspective has been captured and constricted. Okay, and all our educational systems work like that. And they work like that because once you learn something in this world, if you think something counter, everyone ostracizes you. You can't think quote unquote wrong in this world. 
you're ousted, you're called a conspiracy theorist. That's all part of keeping you unaware. By labeling life like that and approaching life like that, when people say things that are outside your normal reality, it's all part of your programming to reject that. And so you have to come into this realization that reality is much larger than you have been taught than you've been shown. And because you're on this very thin vibrational frequency, since you don't know about the other ones, you can be manipulated from those other frequencies without knowing it. That's where this whole picture of this invisible evil comes into play that has infiltrated the human species, the human culture, the human race. And it has seeped itself into our lives, our culture, from this other reality, from this other frequency, which this evil, these evil groups and this evil energy reside in. It's a lower frequency than you. You're a higher frequency being than this energy. That's this evil energy. It's a low, low energy frequency. That's why you can defeat it in and of yourself because you're at a higher resonation point. But if you don't know that, you won't utilize that about yourself and you'll fall prey because you're unaware. Our origin, and you're not knowing our origin, ties into your unawareness and not realizing the power that you have. This is why condemning you to being a slime or a sinner as your origin keeps you from understanding your potential, your higher vibrations that you are, the higher vibration that you are the higher resonance that you carry. Nobody had to teach you how to love. Nobody had to teach you how to hate. Nobody had to teach you how to feel. Nobody had to teach you how to see, how to smell, how to taste. These are in you. That's not bestowed or granted to you. And these senses that you have are there so that you can be consciously aware of your environment so that you can self-develop. And so when you take love and you put it into religion in the sense of you have to love in this way, you have to believe in this way, or you're out, that's called ultimatum. No love is there because love doesn't come through ultimatum. It doesn't come through demand. It doesn't come through requirement. It doesn't come through condition. This is not love. Love is coaxed out by participating, observing, feeling, and sensing, allowing through tolerance. That's where love comes from. It doesn't come from a religion. It doesn't come from outside of you. You are love. You are the fulfillment you are fulfillment. In other words, what I'm trying to say is nothing is missing. There's no lack. What is a sinner filled with? Lack. Lack. That's what a sinner is filled with. Lack. This is why the sinner, the Christian, seeks outside of themselves for fulfillment seeks outside of themselves for love, for understanding, to be saved, asking permission, seeking approval, expecting reproof. These are the behaviors of what? A sinner. It's a program to keep you prostrate. That's what the sinner program is. It's a program to keep you prostrate and needy because a sinner lacks. That's why the evolution and creation stories are bogus because they're based in lack. Because they require a sinner's intellect or a slime intellect. You see? By dumbing you down with creationism and evolutionism, by dumbing you down with those and pigeonholing you and constricting your perspective to those origin theories, I keep you, the world keeps you, anyone that teaches you that can keep, keeps you from realizing your potential. You see, your origin is genetic manipulation. 
our DNA contains DNA that is not from this planet, just like an octopus. That's why the evolutionary theory doesn't jive with reality now. It's a BS theory. And condemning you to being a sinner is another. And I'm sorry, and I say this respectfully, BS theory. Because it holds you in contempt. It holds you in contempt spiritually until you follow the model and do the narrative and act the part. And there have been religions that have been released into the culture to pigeonhole to keep you from seeing the large perspective. Why do you think they locked up Copernicus? Why do you think they locked up these guys with a larger perspective? Tesla. Why do you think they did that? Galileo. These guys had larger perspectives. And when you release that into the human species, what happens? It automatically complexifies because we're self-organizing. I talk about that in my book. The, the universe isn't disintegrating. It builds on itself. This is another lie you've been told. The universe isn't falling apart. It's complexifying. It's getting more and more complicated. Dense with information. And that is growing as it expands. Do you see this? Okay. Your origin, that this is, okay. The reason why you have such articulating appendages and an imagination that builds cities. Do you see monkeys building empires? Do you see that happening? Do you see the squirrel monkeys building skyscrapers? No, you don't. You can build empires. You can do things that no other being on this planet can do that you know of that can do. You see this. That creativity, that ability to generate architecture out of material matter and structurize the world, that's a product of the imagination. There's nothing else on this planet that carries such a strong imagination as you do. And in my opinion, the reason for that is because the DNA that carries your imagination didn't come from this planet. It's alien. Have you ever thought about that? So all this beauty that we can bring to the world, all this music, all this imaginative questing and, and what we bring to the world, right, is the beauty that our DNA has brought about. It's in you. It's in you. And those in charge don't want the cattle to know that. Because if the cattle figure out they're in a pin, they're not going to stay in the pin. When you find out that the medical system has kept you in a sick, toxic pin. When you find that out, guess what you do? If you're a self-respecting, self-loving person, you get out of the pin. You, you leave. That's what I did. You leave. When you realize what you're supporting, what you're involved in, is keeping people in a pin. You leave. What do you see all the doctors doing right now that are finding out about the corruption in the medical system? Guess what they're doing? They're leaving. Self-respect. That's what a human being does. A human being has this thing called self-respect. And if you have it, and you find out you're being conned, and used, and treated like cattle, you don't put up with it anymore but you will put up with it if you're not aware. If you don't know you're in a pin, if you don't know that you're being treated like cattle, you'll accept it. I talk about that in my book. The best trap is the one where people don't even know they're in the trap because then they'll fight to stay in the trap. That's why an allopathic Western medicine doctor will fight to stay that when a naturopathic talks to them and tells them about the importance of nutrition, of which they know nothing. 
So they'll fight to stay in the Western system, even though the nutritionist can show them, you know, that's not a good idea to be taking whatever drugs you're taking for this ailment. You should be taking these vitamins. You should be doing yoga. You should be doing uh, stretching. You should be doing um, all different coffee enemas. You should be doing vitamin C therapy. You should be doing things that ignite and invigorate the natural immune system. You get out of the pen. That's the same thing with religion. When you find out, what the heck? How can this make sense psychologically? And I, I don't have the time to get all into it. I talk about it in my book. But when you find out what religion, what Western religion does to people, you leave. You leave. It's just that most people, they're like the doctor. They don't want to admit because if they admit that they've been conned religiously, their entire world falls apart, just like the doctor. His whole world falls apart. He's been in school for freaking 20 years. He ain't leaving. Even if he is or she is proof wrong, they ain't leaving. Because then their whole world, they lose their money, they, they don't have an income anymore because they gotta leave the system. Right, they're ostracized by all their colleagues. They think he's a whack job, she's a whack job. Yeah, left for that nutritionist stuff, man, is another one of those witch doctor whack jobs, right? I've heard it, man. Same thing with religion. Oh, that person left Christianity? Oh, they're gonna be sent to the torturers now. God's gonna curse them. They're gonna pay for leaving, right? That's what I thought. You leave Christianity, if you're a Christian and you leave Christianity, God is gonna condemn and you're gonna be cursed. You can't leave. Oh, and if you do the worst possible thing, and that is turn people against the religion. How many times have I heard that? Conspiracy, man. These, these are systems, religions are systems to keep you locked into a very tight and intolerant spirituality. So tight, so tight, so tight that if your kids are gay, you'll send them to conversion therapy. How whacked is that? All in the name of love, right? See, people don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand. It's like, it's like the person who is eating wrong and thinks they should be a vegetarian so they cut all the meat out of their life, right? Well, all this meat and nutrition and vitamins that go along with eating meat, which is really good for you, right? They lose all that. They're going to try to get it from soy, which is going to screw up their hormones, right? And they're not going to get the enzymatic load they need, and they're not going to get the necessary vitals for their immune system. I had a nutritionist, a, a naturopathic nutritionist doctor that helped me heal from cancer. You know what she told me? Only 10% can live healthy as vegans. This is from a nutritionist, 30-year vet, who, saved, who helped save my life from cancer naturally. You're going to tell me that she's wrong? <laughs> no, I'm not going to believe you. I have personal friends who have tried to do the vegetarian thing. And when they did it, they felt horrible. And when they went back to meat, they felt great. You've been miseducated. I'm telling you, you've been miseducated. The world is not what you think it is. Just like the politicians, you found out all of them are corrupt. All of them are corrupt. They're all corrupt. There's no good side. And you now will totally admit that. Like, uh, like five years ago, you would have never admitted that. That basically the, the entire Republican Party and Democratic Party, but we knew that, but the entire Republican Party, they're all corrupt. They're all involved. They're all bought and sold. See, you would have called me a whack job, conspiracy nut, like nuthead, if I would have said that seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. But now, what do you do? You join right in. Yep, that's right, Chuck. You got it. That's right. They're all corrupt. Guess what? Guess what? Same thing with religion. Same thing. Same thing. Because it's in you. To use, to use Christian terminology, the Christ is in you. That's the light. 
That's the impossibility that you are that is already in you. You're born with it. There's nothing missing. You're not dirty. Here's, here's the big conspiracy I'm gonna lay on you. You're not dirty. There's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as hell. There's no such thing as heaven. None of it. None of it. You've been conned with all of it. We never die. We're eternal beings. That's what's inside you. The consciousness. Your body's going to die. It's going to pass away. But the consciousness goes on. The awareness, the, the, that, which, that which animates the body. Because you are the light, not the bulb. You're the light. You're not the body. Your body is a carrier of the light that you are. You see, religion doesn't allow that because it says the light is not in you. You get it from Jesus, you get it from Muhammad, you get it from Buddha, whatever. Whatever you wanna believe. All of that is lies because it's already in you. It's simply recognizing that it's already in you. Nothing's missing. And that's the big conspiracy for you to know. Nothing's missing. We're whole just the way that we are. We're perfect just the way that we are. There is there is no need for any of the redemption story, none of it. It's a beautiful story, it's a lovely story, it's a fun story, it's a it's an exhilarating story. But it's not it's not real. And it it has pigeonholed you, it has kept you from understanding who you are. I'm trying to park it, that's why I'm not paying attention to you. It has kept you from understanding who you are because you've bought into the idea that the light is not in you, that you have to pray to get it, that you have to worship a specific God to find it, that it's somehow missing and you can't get it unless you believe right. You see? That is to distract you, it's a red herring. So that you chase the wrong trail. You follow the wrong idea and that misleads you in the same way if I tell you that uh, chemotherapy is going to heal your body. It's not. It's going to melt a tumor maybe, but it's going to toxify your liver. You see? The world is not what you think it is. Love you all. I got to go. Bye.